You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. is Dancing with Words, Dancing with Wisdom with your host, Dr. Janet Smith-Warfield. Dr. Janet explores the meanings of our challenging and ecstatic life experiences, clarifies the meanings of words we use, opens up our minds to more freedom and choice, and offers insights into our everyday lives. Please welcome the host of Dancing with Words, Dancing with Wisdom, Dr. Janet Smith-Warfield. Welcome to Dancing with Words. Dancing with Wisdom. I'm your hostess, Dr. Janet Smith Warfield, with my guest today, Lulu Delphine. You're listening on BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. So let me tell you a little bit about Lulu. She has a Master of Education, she's a certified Body Now facilitator arts integration educator, Montessori teacher. Oh, my gosh. It just goes on and on. Um, The director of the Montana branch of the nonprofit Turning the Wheel. So, oh, oh, and I I do need to add this. Uh, Lulu says, her greatest fortune in life is that she somehow remains that which poet Mary Oliver coined a bride married to amazement <laughs> to me, which is being in the the Buddhist beginner's mind. So anyway, welcome to the show, Lulu. How are you? I'm so well. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, this is going to be a lot of fun. I don't know where it's going, but I guess we'll find out. What, yeah. Won't yes, we? Conver- conversation is the greatest improvisation, isn't it? It is for me. And it, <laughs> it, 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 it requires both really having your head in the present moment and deep listening and deep awareness of what someone else is doing or saying and your own environment, what's going on inside of you. I mean, there's so many dynamics here that you really need to be aware of before you open your mouth and speak. So <laughs> let's talk a little bit, which is what I usually do with my guests. Just um, your childhood, your upbringing, um some of the challenges you had that moved you toward what you do now. You want to talk a little bit about that? I'd be happy to, yeah. I I knew that this was of interest to you because I've been enjoying your podcast for a while. And so I was considering this, thinking about it. Um, And, yeah, there there were three very kind of clear places in my childhood where I felt a little disenchanted you know like what what is this this can't be how it really is and those places ended up being the work that I am dedicated to today and those those pillars or those places were in education so at school um in in my art form which my first art form my first self-expression was really dance I started dancing at three So in my art form and in the wellness, sort of health and wellness realm. Um, But I grew, but just just to back up and and answer your question in general, I grew up in in Missouri, in St. Louis, Missouri. And I had, um, I would say, a fairly typical upbringing, had lots of time outside. That was a huge um, piece of my life, is spending time outside, 
uh, from the moment I was released from school until uh, dinner time, and then after I was able to eat quickly and go back outside again. Um, and um, yeah, so my my first two experiences of, of, of those three pillars would have been the art expression in my dance experience and my experience in school. Um, and my experience in school was uh, sort of maybe what many people could relate to, uh, feeling very uh, restless, very uninterested in the material, and most of all, feeling very disenchanted with uh, that, that it wasn't a discussion, that it wasn't a conversation, and it wasn't an exploration. It was more of a presentation by one person to the group that I was supposed to remember and kind of regurgitate back out when the test came. Um, and from a very young age, I found this to be pretty much after kindergarten. You started, we you know, we started in on that mode of learning, and uh, I had no idea what else existed other than my own exploration in nature and and you know an imaginative play. But I knew that there was something that didn't work for me about it pretty early on. Um, would you like me to just go on about the, the dance experience? As sure, well? sure. Okay, great. Sure. Um, and, and so I, I started, uh, I, I was really fortunate to have parents that wanted to support me and my interests. Um, so I was in dance class all the time um, from a young age and, and just loving that. I'm a mover. I, I, I feel most balanced and most relaxed, uh, most clear-minded when I can have movement in my life on a regular basis. So sports and dance were two of my outlets, two of my greatest joys. And I began dance classes at a young age. And once I got to be, I would say, middle school age, I started getting more serious about it. And I was in a company with other young people. And that was... I mean, I could feel, I could sense something, some competitive um, energies in classes, but for the most part, I was just enjoying myself. But it wasn't until I got into this company that I went, oh, this is, this is re really competitive and people are not feeling supportive. And I thought this was a community, but this isn't, and of course, I don't know what my seventh grade words were for this, but I just knew that something was it wasn't what I wanted. I wanted to be a part of a group that really felt like it was working together and, you know, aligned in a way that was supportive and encouraging and inspiring. And instead, I was a part of a very competitive, uh, sort of uncomfortable um, group. And um, I thought, well, this can't be what dance is. Dance must, you know, there must be some other experience of this because dance is incredible and it's it's one of my greatest joys but this kind of dynamic is not what I'm looking for so here I have the second pillar of just going wait a minute what else is out there you know and I, unfortunately I didn't grow up in a culture where um you know we're in a, a city that that had community dance you know if I had grown up, grown up in another culture perhaps I would have been exposed to more community-based dance, which is what I really, really love. Um, and so those two things were just became, I'm, I'm a seeker. So I, I, I think from those seeds were planted. And from that time on, I just wanted to find out what else was out there because I wasn't willing to let go of the possibility that there is another way to learn. And there, there's another way to express yourself through, through the arts, whatever media you love. Um, and, and I just knew somewhere inside me that there were other experiences of these things that must be out there. So I think from a young age, those seeds were planted of wanting to find other ways to be a part of learning and expressive art. And then and the third, yeah, go yeah, ahead. Go, go, no, you go um, ahead. Okay, so the third piece, the, the health and wellness piece um, kind of came into my life later. Uh, I was 20, 21, something like that. And I was actually, I had uh, graduated college. I must have been 21 because I had graduated college and I was working in an art gallery. And um, I hired someone, I was in charge of hiring. I hired someone to work with me who I was very drawn to immediately when I met her. It wasn't um, a very difficult interview for her because intuitively I felt like we were meant to work together in some way. And so we had a wonderful interview. She she was hired, and we began working together. And I learned um, her story was such that 
she had already had cervical cancer at this young. She was my age. She was in her early 20s. She'd already had cervical cancer. And um, she'd chosen to meet this illness in a very different way than I'd ever heard about. Um, at this point in my life, I had already discovered yoga, but that's about as close as I had gotten to any kind of alternative health uh, philosophies or modalities. Um, and I had been raised in a very kind of Western medical family where we went to the doctor for checkups, and if we got ill, we took a pill. Um, and I had not had good experiences in that Western medical realm. I mean, it, I, I'd never had anything acute and emergency happened to me. So I believe it's really good for that. If I have a broken leg, I definitely want to go to the hospital and get it fixed. But just in terms of wellness, I had not had a good experience. I'd had some fainting spells um, as a young child. And uh, I had to spend some time in the hospital getting very uncomfortable, painful tests as they tried to figure out what was wrong with me. And and um, so th this was, I can continue this story after the break, but it was, it was quite an experience of these people are not helping me and I'm being put through a battery of tests. Uh, so I had an intuitive sense about the health field early on as well. Thanks, Lulu. You are listening to Dancing with Words, Dancing with Wisdom. My guest today is Lulu Delphine. I'm your host, Dr. Janet Smith Warfield. You are listening on BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. Dr. R.C. will share extraordinary resources and services that promote educational success as well as making a difference in the lives of all social workers as well as the lives of children, adolescents, and teens of today. She will have open discussions addressing many of the issues that we face about our youth and how being employed in the uniquely skilled profession of social work for over 18 years has taught invaluable lessons through her personal experiences. She will also provide real-life facts, examples, and personal stories that will confirm that why serving as a child advocate is extremely beneficial when addressing the needs of the whole child. Listen live Saturdays, 10 a.m. Eastern on the BBM Global Network and tune in radio as Dr. R.C. will provide thought-provoking information that will empower, encourage, and strengthen students, families, and communities across our nation. You can also visit her at soarwithkatie.com. Have you ever felt like no one is listening or you're not getting the honest attention you deserve? Do you even know the kind of attention you want or need? You are not alone. Alice Aspen March is here to help. Thanks to Alice, through her epiphany and research over the word attention, there are solutions to the attention dilemma. Worldwide audiences have been enthralled and engaged for over 40 years with her visionary and pioneering observations. The kind of attention we get and give is vital to improving our lives and society. Alice and her weekly guests review game-changing insights for transforming and improving our understanding of attention, providing techniques for creating healthier and empowering behavior. Get a new perspective on a mainstream word. Tune into Why Our Attention Matters for fresh and thought-provoking conversations every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern on BoldBraveMedia.com and the TuneIn Radio app. We are back. Dancing with Words, Dancing with Wisdom. The way today is my guest, Lulu Delphine, and me, your hostess, Dr. Janet Smith-Warfield. You're listening on BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. So, Lulu, at the end of the last segment, you were talking to us about this woman whom you hired. She was around your age, and she... At a very young age, she had already had cervical cancer. So tell us the rest of that story. Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, so this woman uh, shared, as we got to know her, working with her, she shared more about her story. And I was blown away by her courage. She had chosen to heal herself, to approach her journey through Ayurveda. Um, she went to a clinic 
I believe it's in Fairfield, Iowa, called the Raj, and she spent a, a while there. I don't know how long. And she radically changed her diet. She radically changed her lifestyle. And she was able to recover from this very serious cancer. Um, I This opened a whole new possibility for me. And it connected back to the story that I was telling about how I'd had such a, a difficult and, and actually quite unhelpful time in my own medical experience with Western medicine um, when I'd been having fainting spells. And so, I was, yeah. Yeah, no, go ahead, continue. Okay. Uh, and and so I, I was, here I was in this hospital as a young person and getting all of these tests. I had a spinal tap. I had all kinds of things going on. And they weren't able to conclude much about my fainting spells other than that I had low blood sugar. Um, and this was, and I'd also had some dental issues that I thought were handled in a way that seemed wrong to me. Just intuitively, it just seemed so invasive and so not trusting of the body. But, of course, I don't know what words I was using at that young age. Those are the words I'm using now. So when I met this woman who had um, had recovered from cervical cancer through uh, alternative at that time called alternative modalities, I was – it sort of set off a light bulb for me. Um, wow, there's another, there are other options here. There are other ways to heal. And so that, that began my journey into all sorts of um, health modalities uh, that, were, that are considered alternatives to our kind of mainstream Western medicine. And today so I have somehow it. been able yeah. to you know, create a life and a work life that is uh, combined, uh, that is a, an integrated sort of alchemy of these three pillars of uh, dance, health and wellness, and um, education. And I, I would say dance loosely. I would, I, would, I would extend that to the body, body movement, body-based work. So I'm very grateful it's all come together over the years. But I, I can see very clearly the threads back to that disenchantment and, wait a minute, there has to be something else kind of question. And, and, and I went out and found the things, and I'm still finding them every day and able to work in these fields. So I'm very grateful. Let's talk a little bit more about that term that you just used, integrated alchemy. And, of course, alchemy uh, means kind of the ability, the power maybe even, to change something that's going on either inside your body or perhaps in your relationships just by changing yourself. Uh, Does that I mean, is that something you can agree with uh, uh, or do you want to add to or change anything about what I said about alchemy? I love that. I love that so much. That's a huge part of what I do now. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm a nat- I think I'm naturally a kind of cross-disciplinary thinker. So a lot of what I want to do when I experience something is – Look at how it's similar and different from the things I already know. Combine it, you know, integrate it, make something new from it. Um, perhaps this is an artistic way of being. Uh, but yes, I love I love that definition, Janet. It's really beautiful, and it's it's very much about um, the the body based work that I do is very much um, in that line that we can we can affect and change by simply tuning into our bodies. Noticing how that dance and interplay of our bodies with the outside world, notice what's happening inside our bodies, make changes that work for us. Uh, it's, all, it's all kind of a creation coming from inside of us rather than an experience happening outside of us that we constantly have to react to. Boy, there's a lot in what you just said. <laughs> I'm just, uh, <laughs> just trying to assimilate it. I felt the same way about your alchemy definition. Um, okay. <laughs> okay, so what we're really talking about here um, is, I think, creativity and co-creativity in the present moment. And, and I just want to add to what you said uh, about uh, the artistic way of being. You were talking a lot about connecting with the body. But I think part of it, 
an, a major part for me personally is also not only watching what's going on inside my body, but also watching my mind and seeing the relationship between the words that my mind is focused on and what I'm feeling inside of me. And an example of that would just be, for example, if I am, the words that are coming into my my mind are things like, I feel terrible today. I am so tired. Well, uh, you know, I'm exhausted. I hurt. Uh, All I want to do is sleep. I have no energy. If those words are used as simply information about the current bodily state, that can be helpful because then you, once you notice that, you can choose to change them. However, to some extent, they're also an energetic drain on your energy field. So if you turn them around to what can I do right here, right now, you know, how can I move my life forward in the direction I want it to go? Where do I want it to go? So it's it's a whole different mindset and focus, and it changes the energy field. We're dancing with words, dancing with wisdom. My guest today is Lulu Delphine. I'm Dr. Janet Smith Warfield. You're listening on BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy easysense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation Tune into It's All About You with host Dr. Martha Latz, a lively weekly broadcast on BBM Global Network, one of the most empowering shows for time-starved, overscheduled multitaskers. The professional expertise of Dr. Latz is directly available live every Thursday at 1 p.m. to answer and address concerns about relationships, life transitions of career, meeting, dating, and committed relationships. It's All About You with Dr. Latz will expand your understanding of career current concerns across your relationships by broadening and expanding possible solutions in developing skills for mutually desired outcomes. Dr. Martha's expertise is as a licensed marriage and family therapist, life, transition coach, and all things to do with communication at work, home, and with friends. Check out her website at auniquetherapycenter.com. Welcome back. We're Dancing with Words, Dancing with Wisdom. My guest today is Lulu Delphine. I'm your host, Dr. Janet smith Warfield. You're listening on BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. So, Lulu, I think uh, <laughs> you told me during the break that you were interested in expanding on what I was saying about being in right here, right now, with your mind, and then you look at what is going through your mind and you choose the words that are going to help you move forward rather than the words, well, they're words that, that, you know, like I am, I'm not feeling well, I heard all that kind of stuff. So they're words that they're information as long as you don't get emotionally attached to them and and stuck in them. But you can also choose other words that will shift your whole energetic field. And this is where we get back into alchemy. So you said you had some more thoughts about that to dance with. 
Oh, my goodness. I love that whole thing. You always bring up such rich conversation. Um, one of the, there are so many things that came off of that for me, but one of the things that came up was um, noticing. So in the embodiment work I've done, which is basically just the practice of being present with what's going on in your body, right, for anyone who doesn't know that word for some reason, but the embodiment work that I've done, I've noticed that the words we choose, just like you said, can make such a difference. So, for example, I can choose a judgment-based word. Like I'm feeling um, anxiety, for example, right? Today I'm feeling so much anxiety. Um, and I can also work, you know, work with the body to just notice what the sensations are that are coming up in my body. And anxiety might be there, but I might, instead of labeling anxiety, I might just notice, okay, I feel a little constriction in my throat, I feel butterflies in my stomach. And in that way, you're still using words to describe it, which I think I agree. I think it's so helpful to just name what's going on, right, through words and through sensation. But I think it's really interesting to play with using words that are not necessarily value judgments, good or bad, but that are uh, because we, most of us think of anxiety as a negative experience, right, but as working with the sensations that are coming up in your body and just describing it as such um and you know there are all sorts of ways to do that with color and temperature and sensation and everything else and then the other thing you said that i love so much was if we are so busy labeling what's going on either in our minds or our bodies that we are what i would say organized around that as truth we naming something and kind of making up a story about it that you're organized around so that everything you do think and feel comes through the filter of I'm tired. Um, and also, if you notice that you're tired, you can also, like you said, do something that you need to do to, to uh, what do I need right now, right? I'm going to take a little rest. I'm going to take a 20-minute power nap or whatever it is that works for you. So I just loved all those ideas. And I loved your distinction between body and mind, too, working with the mind and working with the body. The mind will take me in all kinds of directions I don't want to go if I let it. But it can be such an incredible ally if I'm, if I'm working with it in a collaborative way. <laughs> Yeah, and and that's the challenge. But each one of us, you were talking about the self-healing before of your friend by using, first of all, by noticing the words flying through our minds and noticing the energetic effect on our bodies. Once we're aware of that, then we can choose whether to hold on to those same words and continue with those same stories or whether to create a new story or a new focus using our words that is going to actually support our body better. So there's a there's an integration, there's a flow back and forth on this. And I'm just going to say this again. I've said it before on the show, but I think it's important because so many people struggle struggle with fear, particularly these days. When you are feeling fear, first of all, you've got to notice that you're feeling fear. Then once you feel that, then you go start watching where your mind is focused. And I can gar- almost guarantee you it's focused in one of two places. It's either focused in the future. What if this happens? What if this that happens? What if I catch COVID-19? What if I don't have enough money to pay my rent? It's all the what ifs this happens. What if that happens? Or... The other place where your mind might be focused is on what somebody else may think, say, or do if you take the next step that's going to move you forward. And as as I say that, I'm thinking back to your earlier stories about the the competitive dance class or the the kind of rigid type didactic lectures that you received in middle school where you were supposed to simply memorize words and then regurgitate them back to so you could get a good score on a test. And I'm thinking when you're just stuck in the words without using them as energetic tools, uh, you're in you're in a prison really. And it's yeah. 
it's really helpful to break out of that. The other piece about the fear is once you notice where your mind is, and as I say, usually it's either focused on what somebody else may think, say, or do. For example, in your middle school, had you chosen to break those rules or you know, get up and walk around because you were really bored, you probably would have been disciplined hard and you didn't want that to happen, so you didn't do it. But um, the other thing is once you notice where your mind is, then you can choose if you want to, you can leave it right where it is and get stuck in your story, or you can choose to bring your mind back to the present moment. And then you ask yourself, what can I do right here right now to move my life in the direction I wanted to go. You know, what can I do to um, interest me instead of sitting here being bored, for example? So it's a, it's a whole different mindset, a whole different set of questions. And once you bring your mind back to the present moment and you ask yourself, what can I do to move my life forward right here, right now? There's always something you can do. You take your power back instead of giving it away to another person who wants to control you. Yes. Yes. Yes, and I'd love to segue. I I know we need to take a break in a moment, but I'd love to segue into uh, some of the movement work that I've done because we go at it from the angle of giving people experiences, what I call positive experiential reference points. They have an experience of collaboration or being seen or leadership. And and once that lives in their body, they're they're in it. They're in that possibility. And then they can backtrack and notice, how do I get back to that again? Because I want that experience again. So we can talk about that. Yeah. We we shall do that when we come (laughs) back. (laughs) <laughs> to Dancing with Words, Dancing with Wisdom. My guest today is the wonderful Lulu Delphine. I'm your host, Dr. Janet Smith Warfield on BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. Author, radio show host, and coach John M. Hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them, rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and to Tune in radio. According to the American Nurses Association, there are approximately three and a half to four million nurses in the United States. So where do all these nurses work? What kind of roles do they have? What kind of education and training help to prepare them for so many different settings? What kind of impact do nurses have on patient outcomes? The World Health Organization has announced that 2020 will be the year of the nurse, honoring the 200th birth anniversary of Florence Nightingale, an international initiative called Nurse Nursing Now is underway to raise the profile of nursing. The National Academy of Medicine has convened a committee to create the future of nursing 2020 to 2030 that will focus on how the nursing profession can create a culture of health, reduce health disparities, and improve the health and well-being of the U.S. population. Learn more and join Joyce Batchelor on All About Nursing, Wednesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Central Standard Time on the BBM Global Network. Welcome back to Dancing with Words, Dancing with Wisdom. I'm your host, Dr. Janet Smith Warfield, with my guest today, Lulu Delphine, uh, connected with Turning the Wheel. We can talk about that later. You are listening on BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. So, Lulu, let's talk a little bit more about the movement work that you do right now and how actually a really positive experience. You don't lecture them. You don't 
throw a pile of words at them that you are then demanding that they memorize and repeat back to you. You're giving them a living, breathing, positive experience. Talk to us about that. Yes, well, I discovered uh, the work of Turning the Wheel uh, back in 2011, and um, I went to uh, what was called a romp with my family. I had two daughters and my partner, and this was a kind of promoted as a family event where we would, uh, you know, kind of there'd be a live musician and we would engage in kind of creative movement together, and. This scares some people. It didn't scare me. I love creative movement, and I thought, I'm probably really going to enjoy this, and I did. I It was the first time in so long that I hadn't been sitting in a chair with the other parents on the sidelines while my children did something interesting, <laughs> reading my book. You know, and it was we were in it with them. We were engaged. We were being guided through uh, what I would call improvisational movement games all together. So we were creating bonds. We were laughing. We were interacting with other families and we were having fun. And from that time, I fell in love with turning the wheel. And I and I could see that it was a combination of all the things I loved. It, there was there was the art of dance and movement and creative expression. It was a health and wellness activity for sure because we were all so positive in collaboration and witnessing each other and supporting each other. And um, and it was an education based event as well. We we're not only learning about ourselves, but we were learning about each other, and we were learning truly standards of dance and theater because of the movement forms we were engaging in. So from that time, I knew that I wanted to get more involved with Turning the Wheel, and um, that is some of the work that I do right now. It's a huge part of the work I do right now. And we have I have gone on with Turning the Wheel to work all over the country uh, with every group you can possibly imagine. I've worked with prison guards. I've worked with teachers. I've worked with survivors of domestic abuse. I've worked with third graders. I've worked with kindergartners. I've worked with college students. I've worked with all sorts of people. And that's been a huge gift to me because I love seeing how the work shows up with different people and, um, and how we can craft something to meet them. Uh, but yeah, when I was talking about those positive experiential reference points in the last segment, I have seen that we present them with a series of experiences, and before you know it, they are showing up in whatever unique way they bring. And that's one beautiful thing about the modality is come as you are. I think you said that earlier. Come as you are. You can be, you can be in a good mood. You can be in a bad mood. You can be from the, the most difficult life circumstances. You can be from the most privileged life circumstances. And we do work with diverse groups. And it doesn't, it, there's no one right way to show up. I'm not standing up there giving people dance moves that they're supposed to regurgitate back to me. They are all, it's all springing from inside. So we're giving them these experiences which are designed to teach certain qualities, right? Certain life skills, whether it's collaboration or, um, you know, the leadership or any of the life innovation, right? Imagination. We're giving them these life skills through play and we learn faster through play than through anything else any any anything needs to be repeated so many times it's just rote memorization through play it happens much faster so people are coming into new possibilities like that like the snap of a finger and the more they do it the more their body naturally wants to orient back to that so i don't have to stand up in front of a class and tell them that they shouldn't treat each other a certain way let's say i'm giving some sort of bullying lecture right i don't have to teach them about what bullying is and how they should act and the steps that they should take to be a good person we give them experiences and opportunities to be collaborative, to be supportive, to be engaged in a positive, healthy way. And they go, whoa, that feels good. I think I'd like to make that choice again from the inside <laughs> out, right, instead of the outside in. So as you can tell, I'm pretty excited about it. <laughs> and um, yes, I have some I, other I, pillars of, of embodiment work I can tell you about too, but, but I can stop there for now. Well, actually, I want to ask you a question, which is, 
Do you ever try to attract bullies into your play, or are they people that are have probably been so abused themselves that they are not open to receiving what you have to offer? Yes, I mean, as a nonprofit organization, we are able to serve all people that we can get a program with. So when we show up in a school, we have a whole range of people with different backgrounds and experiences. And we specifically go around to as many places as we can to work with as many diverse populations as we can. We've had members of, we've had groups where there are members of opposing gangs in the group and they are collaborating and interacting with each other. And the other thing is, yes, there are some people who are kind of going, what is this? This is kind of weird. I don't know if I want to do this. And I think we're really good at giving them the opportunity, A, to show up as themselves, and B, um, the opportunity to, to just be, well, really, that's what I said at first, to be who they are in the moment and give them pedestrian, the other thing I wanted to say is give them sort of pedestrian, easy to access, accessible activities to do. So I'm not going to get up there and try to teach them dance technique where they have to be a certain level in order to do it. We are doing accessible games that anyone can do. We've even worked with people, you know, who are um, in elder homes. We've worked with all sorts of groups. So we're really good at crafting things that meet people where they are and that provide an opportunity for success that we want them to feel successful and we want them to feel you know like they can access this this experience they're bringing not to feel like they have to reach for it or compete with other people in the class what how would you handle oh okay we're coming to the end of a segment i was uh, i guess we're gonna to have to deal with that question when we come back uh, my guest today is lulu delphine i'm your hostess dr janet smith warfield you're listening to dancing with words dancing with wisdom on bbm global network and tune in radio Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416 529 7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well, be aware, be magical. Renaissance woman, trailblazer, maverick. Those are just some of the words to describe to Chandra Poulard, owner and CEO of House of Virgo Entertainment, LLC, a woman minority veteran-owned entertainment company based in Washington, D.C. Ms. Poulard served 10 years honorably in the United States Navy and departed from active duty to pursue her dreams of becoming an entertainment mogul. House of Virgo Entertainment offers script writing, producing, directing, DJ services, editing, and more. They cater to businesses, corporations, college students, working professionals, aspiring artists and nonprofit organizations, and employ veterans of the armed forces. Tashandra Poulard is pioneering the way we view media and taking her brand global. Visit her at www.houseofvirgoentertainment.com or call 281-515-3740 and like her on Facebook at House of Virgo Entertainment, LLC. We are back. Dancing with Words, Dancing with Wisdom, the we today being my guest, Lulu Delphine. I'm your host, Dr. Janet Smith-Warfield on BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. So the question I was going to ask you, Lulu, before the break was when you are in an educational situation with say 30, I don't know whether you have that many in your class, maybe not, but say 30 very different, unique children from different backgrounds, which is 
to some extent always the case. And you have some really creative children uh, maybe who feel different from other children and then you've got bullies in the class and the bullies start picking on the creative children how do you handle that well the such a great question there's so many pieces to it i'm going to try to answer it as simply as possible first of all um the the facilitators are coming into the class and being trained in the, in the turning the wheel modality so as to look at people um, without labels. So we don't ask for labels unless there's absolutely something we have to know, like this person cannot be touched, for example. That would be something I would need to know before the class. Otherwise, I don't know much about the backgrounds of the children, but you see certain things coming out as you start working with them. Um, and we keep the pace of the class going, and we keep engaging them in various and different ways. There's really no opportunity so much for someone to pick on someone else. Um, we haven't had so much of that happening. It's, a, it's, like a, it's, it's often taking place in a circle. Of course, now we're modifying our curriculum a bit with the COVID guidelines, and that's, that's a whole other conversation. But... Um, so, so we keep the pace of the class going, and we keep teaching to the, the positive. So I don't turn my attention on someone who seems to be, like, for example, a lot of the problems that some of the so-called bullies or difficult problem children have stem from the fact that they're not, they're not being met in their current situation. And it might also have something to do with their history of trauma or something else. But what we want to do is meet them in a new way. So we're giving them opportunities to show up in a different way. They're not being asked to sit still and be quiet, which can be very difficult for some children. In fact, some of the children who have the most trouble in a in a classroom situation end up shining in our classes because they're able to actually move their bodies and make sound. And so that just, works just in give, our advantage. Give us, Go ahead. Give us a, a specific example of mm-hmm. how you meet a bully in a new way. And if the bully starts picking on another child, do you do an intervention at that point to protect the other child? Yes. So the the intervention could look as simple as a facilitator. We usually work with several facilitators in a room. So a facilitator might go over and just stand next to that child in the circle so as to put a a space between that child and the child that they might be standing next to and bothering. Um, What was the other part of your question? I I think that was pretty much it. It just give it, me a they're, specific they're, they're, example. You know what they are? They're redirections rather than confrontations. So okay, what good. we're doing is we're watching, we're trained to watch what might happen, and we're putting out fires before, I'm sorry, we're preventing fires rather than putting them out. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is if something comes up, we're redirecting and we're continuing to model um, the, the, the behavior that we want to instill. And the games and the forms that we use do so much of the work for us because we're putting people in a situation where they get a chance to be seen and they get a chance to lead, which doesn't often happen in a lot of classrooms. So when they get a chance to be seen, many of the problems stem from the fact that they just want to be seen. They're not seen all day long. And this is absolutely no criticism toward teachers. I think teachers are the hardest working and most underpaid people. I was a teacher for many years, and I love and respect teachers and love working with them. It's more about the system and how it's set up, which poses challenges for the whole community of the classroom. So, um, so yeah, it's, it is a big question. There's a lot to do with our forms. There's a lot to do with our modes of interac- um, in, intervention. We, we don't fix. We, I, I, I approach my body work clients this way, too. I'm not there to fix someone. I'm there to look for what their potential is and just open the door, and then they get to walk through it. They get to see it. They get to feel it. And I'm just there to sort of stand with them shoulder to shoulder and experience it with them. And that's exactly what we're doing in Turning the Wheel. We're standing shoulder to shoulder with all the students. We're in it with them, and we're exploring together. And it's amazing how quickly some of these, quote, problems 
work themselves out. And yes, we would never, we, it's a huge goal in our organization to not have anyone feel unsafe in our classes. So we create conditions for safety, and there's a lot of ways we do that, but it's a, huge, it's a goal because we want everyone, you can't feel safe, you can't express yourself if you don't feel safe, right? So, so we want people to feel safe in our classes. Yeah, boy, you covered a lot in a short period I know, of time. I'm to get it <laughs> <laughs> so, we, so we don't have much time left. What are some of the most important things that you want to talk about right now? Oh my goodness! Well, I am just my intention of being on the call. It's so refreshing to not be trying to promote a book or something. <laughs> I like to just come on the call. My intention to be being here is to just share something that is hopefully of service to certain people listening. I'm sure different people resonate with different things. Um, I could share a little bit about some of the other body-based work I do that I'm passionate about. Um, would you be interested in that? Well, sure would, but let's hear okay. it. Sure. I, I would love to share this with people because I think it's a field that's really up and coming. Okay, I'll share it after the break, but um, it's arts integration field. Okay, okay, and, and wow, are we flying here? I think we're dancing a really fast dance, uh, <laughs> dancing with words and wisdom, little Delphine, and me, John, Dr. Janet Smith Warfield on BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. <laughs> Global Glory, that's the work of Dr. Marina McLean, COO of Global Glory, whose calling is to serve God. A first-generation British-born Londoner of Jamaican descent, Dr. McLean inherited the hunger for the word from her father, who was a Bible teacher. Growing up, her home was filled with missionaries from the Caribbean islands and America, and she travels the world preaching the gospel. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree in theology and an honorary doctorate of divinity and Christian counseling from Friends International Christian University. Dr. McLean is also a songwriter and recording artist, and her songs are written during summits and conferences in the presence of God. She's recorded three worship albums to date and is in ministry for 28 years alongside her husband, Dr. Rennie McLean, who shares her passion. Visit www.globalglory.org or on Facebook at Global Glory. Call 866-244-5679 and feel the glory. Escape from Hell, A Woman's Story is a passionate book that tells the true story of author Rhonda Knudsen's journey through the darkness and adversity of abuse. The book takes readers on an emotional trail from the depths of despair to the heights of forgiveness and understanding. She was inspired to help others, and her book is a vital tool through this process. Faithful to God and devotional to her beacon of hope, Rhonda Knudsen is a perfect example of finding a guiding light that helped her come through the dark and into the light. Her book can assist you in overcoming your challenges with abuse. The publication of Escape from Hell, A Woman's Story is a triumphant achievement and it can help you take ownership of your own experience of abuse and come through stronger than before. Rhonda is currently working on two more books, Shadows of Corruption and Coast to Coast on a Piece of Toast. To read more about this inspiring author and purchase her books, visit RhondaKnutson.com or go to www.amazon.com. We are back. Dancing with Words, Dancing with Wisdom. I'm your hostess, Dr. Janet Smith-Warfield, with my guest today, the, the lovely dancing Lulu Delphine. <laughs> you're, lis- you're listening on BPM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. So, Lulu, we've got a very short time left. Uh, you, you did, I believe, want to talk to us a little bit about... I mean, look for my arts integration. So, talk yeah. to us fast about. It. I'll talk with you. And then that. tell okay. us where, and and also tell people more if any of this interests them. Okay, I will do. Um, so, I as you as as you heard from my story, I was terribly disenchanted with education, and so I've launched myself into a life of finding out how else we can shift the education paradigm. And one of the things that I have discovered in the last few years that I've fallen completely in love with is arts integration work. And arts integration is where you teach a subject, a content, you know, there's all sorts of required content that teachers have to teach in school. 
um, science, math, reading, right? And you teach that content through an art form. So students are getting exposure to an art form and all the wonderful benefits of exploring that, whether it be photography or painting or dance, whatever it is. And they're also learning science or math or language arts at the same time. So I think it's brilliant, and it's the most beautiful cross-disciplinary, forward visionary thinking work that I've done, aside from turning the wheel perhaps. And I'm, I'm super excited about it. I got involved with it through Spark Arts, which is an organization in Montana. And they were um, started through the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. And the Kennedy Center has a few of these branches around the country. And I was trained in arts integration. So I've been teaching people science and math through dance. And I've been teaching, I'm also a photographer, so I've been teaching people um, language arts through photography and oh my goodness the speed and ease at which these children can rattle off what they learned after having the experience of the art form is unbelievable so so arts are arts for art's sake very good and arts for other sakes very good <laughs> Lulu, thank you so much for being my guest today. This has been this has been an explosive dance we've been doing today, I think, and I'm so I've so enjoyed it. Um, next week I have another amazing woman guest. Her name is Nancy Matthews. Uh, and she has thirty years of experience blending business expertise, authenticity, and heart. She's Mm -hmm. developed several multi-million dollar enterprises. She's the co-founder of Women's Prosperity Network, the author of The One Philosophy, Visionaries with Guts, the highly acclaimed Receiving Your Riches course, and the best-selling series, Journey to the Stage. So join us next week when Nancy Matthews will be my guest. I'm your hostess, Dr. Janet Smith-Warfield. You've been listening to Dancing with Words, Dancing with Wisdom on BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. This has been Dancing with Words, Dancing with Wisdom with your host, Dr. Janet Smith-Warfield. Listen each week as Dr. Janet uses words in atypical ways to shift you into experiences beyond words and transforming turmoil into inner peace. Here on Dancing with Words, Dancing with Wisdom. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.